Hi everyone and welcome back to our class in Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning in Finance. In the last video we've seen the Maximal Margin Classifier. And if you look at this slide here, we saw that the Maximal Margin Classifier is actually quite sensitive to um, new data. If we add new data points, then the decision boundary, which is uh, the line here, for example here, um, is quite sensitive to these newly added observations. So the question is, can we make this classifier a little less sensitive to new observations and a little more forgiving? And this is where we actually now arrive at the so-called support vector classifier. It's not yet the support vector machines that we want to talk about in this section, but it's the support vector classifier, which is also usually summarized um, under this name support vector machines. So the solution is we use a classifier that allows for some observations, not all of course, but for some observations to be incorrectly specified uh, and classified. And you can see this here, for example, if we add this observation 11 and this observation 12, uh, even though 11 is red and 12 is blue, um, the decision boundary doesn't change too much due to these newly added observations that make um, the decision boundary no longer a separating hyperplane. So we want to have a little discretion when it comes to the classification of the observations. And this is what the support vector classifier does. So the um, difference to the maximal margin classifier can be seen here in uh, the optimization that leads to the support vector classifier or the support vector hyperplane that we used to classify, we again um, use um, our um, constant m. Um, we have our um, parameters beta 0, beta 1, etc. for the hyperplane. And now we have additional variables epsilon 1 through epsilon n. And we maximize m with respect to these parameters. We have the same constraint in line 28. Uh, that is, um, the squared coefficients all add up to 1. And the difference now is, first of all, that um, the hyperplane, the observations, should not be exactly higher or lower than m. So it's um, not like we are again looking for a separating hyperplane, but we have some discretion and uh, this um, error that is possible is actually included here with these so-called slack variables that allow the observations to be on the wrong side at least a little bit, what is what actually happens here. So we would expect 11 to be on this side, but it's okay that it's actually a little bit off and a little bit above the hyperplane. So then this would be captured in the slack variable and we allow, or we demand of course, that the slack variables are uh, non-negative. And we have an additional hyperparameter, which is C, so that the sum of all those slack variables, in other words, the sum of the errors that we allow, this needs to be smaller or equal than C. So C is, of course, a non-negative tuning hyperparameter. It's chosen via cross-validation. And M is, again, the margin. So this is the support vector classifier. We see four different support vector hyperplanes in these slots, uh, plots. And as you can see um, from the title, um, e these plots um, result from different choices for the tuning hyperparameter C. For example, the largest value of C was used in the top left panel. Smaller values were used then in top right, bottom left and bottom right. So um, we have four different values. And actually when C is large, then there is a high tolerance for observations being on the wrong side of the margin. And so the margin will be very large. And as C decreases, as we reduce the maximum um, allowed sum of errors, as C decreases, this tolerance for observations being on the opposite, on the wrong side of the hyperplane, uh, decreases and the margin narrows. So you can see this here. This is, let me see, this is actually the margin from this side and from this side. And as you can see, it is reduced in each plot going from top left to bottom right. Now, the question now is, 
are we done? Well, actually, no, because is a linear classifier always warranted? Well, and if you have a look at this plot, you can immediately see no. Um, you can try your best at using a plane, a hyperplane, that is a line here, to separate the blue and red points. Then, for example, if you were to use this line, then you have those observations here that make a problem um, and cause a problem. You can use a hyperplane like this. Uh, it doesn't really help. What you really need is something um, actually that is nonlinear. For example, uh, it could be something like this, or it could be something like this, would also be useful. So a linear hyperplane uh, is not warranted here, and we need sort of a nonlinear classifier, and this is where we finally get um, in the next couple of slides to the support vector machines. Well, the support vector classifier is a linear one. So how can we automatically convert it to a classifier with nonlinear decision bounds? First thing we could try is that um, we again uh, maximize the margin. We use the betas, the epsilons and m as um, our parameters. And we now say, okay, we are not using a hyperplane, but uh, for example, as you can see here, this is again the response being minus one or one, uh, the margin, and we uh, allow a certain error in the select variables. Um, but here in parentheses, where previously we had a linear hyperplane, we now allow what is a polynomial function. So just like we did with polynomial regression, we allow the decision boundary to be a polynomial one. And um, this is one way of doing it. Problem is, it might not be enough. Uh, a polynomial regression, we've seen that adds some flexibility to our model. Same here, but um, it might be that we need more nonlinearity. So how can we achieve this? First of all, recall the standards, in this case, the Euclidean in a product for two vectors, xi and xi bar, um, dash actually, um, you have the scalar product, the Euclidean in a product of two vectors. And we need this because the linear support vector classifier can be represented. It's just a different representation, different way of showing what the support vector classifier looks like uh, with n parameters Alpha i actually is what? It's the hyperplane is given by beta zero plus the sum of parameters alpha i times the inner product products of x and xi. So in other words, um, we can use um, this representation. Where did I get it? This here, which is it's a linear function. It's a linear line, a plane, or whatever, um, and and the hyperplane can also be represented in this way. So instead of using beta 1 times x, beta 1, uh, x1, beta 2 times x2, and so on, we can also use the inner products. We get a different set of parameters. Now these are alpha i and beta 0, of course. Um, and to estimate these, we only need those n times n minus 1 divided by 2 inner products between all pairs of training observations. At first, this sounds like a lot. If we are looking at a big data sample, then obviously if we have like 1 million observations, then we would also have 1 million, um, uh, no, actually 1 million times almost 1 million divided by 2 uh, inner products um, and we have uh, n um, observations and n parameters. However, uh, alpha i is non-zero only for the support vectors in the solution. You can again see why they are called support vectors. Um, and this means that we actually don't need all those n parameters alpha i, but um, we have a much smaller number of parameters um, that we need to represent the um, hyperplane from the support vector classifier. Now, why do we need this? Why do we need this different representation for the support linear um, classifier? Well, um, the linear support vector classifier can be extended in a very simple way. And how? We replace the inner product 
with a more general so-called kernel. What is a kernel? A kernel K, in, at least in the context of machine learning, it has slightly different meanings uh, in different parts of mathematics and statistics, but here in the context of machine learning, a kernel is a function that quantifies the similarity of two observations. So we have two observations, x1 and x2, and a kernel is a function that in some way measures the similarity. Uh, could also be the distance between those two points, and this is what we call a kernel. Quite clear, in the case of the inner product, this is, of course, um, a function that measures the distance in the Euclidean space between those two vectors. Um, so we need to replace the inner product. We need to replace, where's my cursor here? We need to replace the inner product here with a different kernel, and then we get a, a more general extension of the support vector classifier. And this is um, what finally is a support vector machine. We can use different kernels. For example, we can use the linear kernel. We can also use a polynomial kernel of degree d, or quite often use uh, the so-called radial kernel or radial basis function kernel, which is given in equation 37. So these are different choices for comparing xi and xi dash two vectors. And if we now, um, if we now substitute the linear kernel by say the radial kernel we get a different classifier and if we substitute the linear one with a non-linear kernel the resulting classifier is known as a support vector machine or svm in equation 38 you see we now only speak of a general kernel k and what is important is as i mentioned before we don't need all n um, parameters because these parameters alpha i will be non-zero only for the support vectors. So the set S that includes the indices for the support vectors is usually much smaller than n, and this representation is only um, is we only need these um, indices in the set S. So that's the set of support vectors. That's a support vector machine substituting the linear kernel with a non-linear kernel and what we get um, is a much finer way of classifying these observations. Uh, on the left-hand side, you see a polynomial um, kernel. You see that um, we have our observations here, and we would have liked um, those red um, observations uh, to be separated from the blue ones. And the polynomial kernel does this. And actually, as you can see on the right-hand side, the radial basis function kernel works even better. So these are support vector machines. Um, they are estimated in a similar way as the um, support vector classifier. And all these classifiers, actually the maximal margin classifier, the support vector classifier, and these more general support vector machines, usually they are all summarized under the name of support vector machines. So these um, are SVMs, that's the theory, and in the next video we'll be looking at some applications.